Let's see, for those of you who are not philosophers, this will be the most difficult lecture. Um, but once you scale this peak, after that it's downhill, a nice gentle slope. So, um, <laughs> My guess is that some of the professional theologians among you, and those aspiring to become, become professional theologians, are beginning to feel a bit uncomfortable. When I presented to you my project of identifying and articulating the understanding of God implicit in the Christian liturgy, you were, I hope and trust, open to seeing where this might go. You have now seen a bit of where it goes, and it seems to you like sort of thin broth. You are familiar with theology that has been thickened by centuries of controversy over the Trinity, over the incarnation, over justification, over election, over double predestination, over divine sovereignty, over divine foreknowledge, and so forth, and so forth. Uh, the theology that Professor Bruce McCormick presented to you in his cancer lectures of two years ago was theology of that sort. Theology thickened by his engagement with centuries of controversy over Trinity and incarnation. I read those lectures. It was thick stew. What you've gotten from me is thin broth by comparison. Nothing complicated. No argumentation with anybody else. Is this what liturgical theology comes to? Not only is it thin, it's strange. Strange in a way that may not be so easy to identify. It's certainly not deistic theology. No deist believes that God listens and speaks to us. But neither is it your usual generic theism that you typically get from philosophers. Nothing here about the familiar trio of omnis, nothing about omnipotence, nothing about omniscience, nothing about omni-goodness, and nothing about simplicity, immutability, impassibility, eternity, and the like. But also nothing about God as trinity or about God incarnate about God as listener and speaker. That's strange. Something else may be making you feel uncomfortable. Isn't it patently anthropomorphic to speak of God as listening and speaking to us? Are we not making God in our own image when we speak this way? This is how children talk about God. If this is the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy, we who are adults will have to stop participating. Or if we desire to continue participating, we'll have to contest the conclusion that this really is the understanding of God implicit in the liturgy, that God listens and speaks. We'll have to engage in a, what I call the Maimonides style analysis of the liturgy. So in this lecture, I want to address the worry that we are making God in our own image when we speak of God as listening and speaking. Those of you who felt uncomfortable with our discussion up to this point, because of its very idiosyncratic character, are now, I think, going to find your discomfort level substantially lowered. Instead of probing the liturgy so as to make explicit what is implicit, we'll now be engaging in the ever so traditional topic, very traditional topic, of the status of predications concerning God. Indeed, this present discussion, I think, is going to feel so different to you, to you, is going to feel so different from what preceded, that I wouldn't be surprised if you're wondering whether we have not perhaps left liturgical theology behind. No, we won't have left it behind. Liturgical theology, I said, can be thought of as coming in three stages. Starting from the liturgy as a whole, or some part thereof, the liturgical theologian first tries to understand what's going on in the liturgy as a whole, or in that part of it. That done, he then tries second to make explicit the understanding of God that's implicit in that part of the liturgy. And then, that done, he goes on thirdly, insofar as there's time, to articulate that understanding, to develop it theologically, defend it against objections, and so forth. In addition, if along the way, 
he comes to the conclusion that the understanding of God implicit in some part of the liturgy is defective, he'll offer a critique of that aspect of the liturgy. And that critique will then also be a component of his comprehensive liturgical theology. So our topic, I say in this lecture, is whether or not it is unacceptably anthropomorphic to think and speak of God as listening and speaking. Within which of those three stages, um, describing some aspect of the liturgy, identifying what's theologically implicit, and then articulating it, within which of the three stages of liturgical theology does this present topic fall? Well, the, the topic can be treated in a number of ways. And depending on how it's treated, I would say it falls either in the first, identifying what's going on, or in the third, articulating. First, first or the third stages of the three stages of art, liturgical theology. As I'll be treating it, it's mainly going to fall within the first stage. I've claimed that in much of the liturgy, we are addressing God, and doing so on the assumption that God listens, and in the hope or expectation that God will respond favorably. I'll be defending that analysis of the liturgy against a Maimonides-style objection. So let's actually start with Maimonides. <laughs> In his Guide of the Perplexed, remember the Guide of the Perplexed. Um, imagine student Joseph, Jewish, young Jewish student, who's been studying philosophical theology in the classroom. He's come to various conclusions that nothing, nothing positive, affirmative can be said about God, only negative. But this young Jewish student, whom Maimonides imagines, is also a faithful attender at, um, at synagogue, where he hears the Torah read and the liturgy and so forth, and he finds all kinds of positive, positive things said about God. So Guide to the Perplexed is an attempt to dissolve the perplexity. Here's what Maimonides says in the Guide. Since all these acts are performed by means of bodily organs, all these organs are figuratively ascribed to God, those by means of which locomotion takes place. I mean the feet and their soles, those by means of which hearing, seeing, and smelling come about, that is the ear, the eye, and the nose, those by means of which speech and the matter of speech are produced, that is the mouth, the tongue, and the voice. To sum all this up, God, may he be exalted above every deficiency, has had bodily organs ascribed to him, feet and tongue and so forth, in order that his acts may be, in order that his acts should be indicated by this means. And those particular acts are figuratively ascribed to him in order to indicate a certain perfection, which is not identical with the particular act mentioned. Action and speech are ascribed to God so that an overflow proceeding from him should thereby be indicated. Organs of speech are mentioned with a view to indicating the overflow of the intellect toward the prophets and so forth. <laughs> Taking for granted that speaking is a bodily act, Maimonides argues that since God has no mouth, tongue, or vocal cords, God cannot literally speak. And his positive proposal is that we should understand ourselves as using language figuratively when we attribute speech to God, an overflowing of the intellect. Since our language, use of language is figurative, we are not engaged in anthropomorphizing. Now in the passage quoted, and, no, in, and the rest of the guide, in the passage quoted, Maimonides does not say that God cannot literally listen. There can be no doubt, however, that that was his view. Taking for granted that listening is a bodily act, he would argue that since God has no eyes or ears, God cannot listen. And so, just as we should understand ourselves as using language figuratively when we attribute speech to God, so we should understand ourselves as using language figuratively when we attribute listening to God. Now, whatever is to be said about Maimonides' positive proposal as to how we should interpret Torah and the, and the liturgy, speech act theory makes clear that his argument for the claim that God cannot literally speak or listen is unsound. Our address to God consists of the illocutionary acts that we perform with the aim or purpose that God attend to them, grasp them, and respond favorably. 
And we perform, we perform these elocutionary acts by performing certain locutionary acts. But it's not our utterance of a sentence with a certain meaning in mind that we address to God. It's our illocutionary act of praising God, thanking God, interceding with God that we address to God. And those illocutionary acts are not bodily actions. We do indeed perform them by doing something with our bodies, but they're not themselves bodily actions. They are, as I noted, imperceptible particulars. <laughs> Listening to what one was said to one, attending to, grasping the elocutionary act performed, is likewise not a bodily action. You and I attend to and grasp the speech acts of our fellows by means of employing our ears or eyes. We hear the uttered sentence or see the written sentence. But our attention to and grasping of the illocutionary act itself is not something that we do with our ears or eyes, since that act, illocutionary act, is imperceptible. So the fact that God has no ears or eyes is not a reason for holding that God cannot listen. When the psalmist says, incline your ear to me, hear my words, we are to understand the words incline your ear and the word hear as being used figuratively. Maimonides is right about that. Literally speaking, God has no ear to incline so as to hear words. But if we're thinking along the lines of speech act theory, we will understand the psalmist with this figurative use of language as asking God to attend to and be cognizant of the illocutionary act that he's performing. And that illocutionary act was not something that could be seen or heard. It was, to say it again, an imperceptible particular. Of course, if it were impossible for God to attend to and grasp an illocutionary act, without hearing or seeing the locutionary act, whose performance counts as the performance of the illocutionary act, then God's lack of ears and eyes would imply that God can't listen. But why would one hold that God cannot apprehend the illocutionary act? Recall once again what it is to listen to what someone said. It's to attend to and become cognizant of the illocutionary act that was performed. So to attribute listening to God is to say of God that God has knowledge of imperceptible particulars of a certain sort, namely illocutionary acts. And if God can know the innermost secrets of our hearts, why would God be incapable of knowing the illocutionary acts that we perform? Fair enough, you might say. But to point out that listening is a species of gaining cognizance of an imperceptible particular is patently inadequate as a full response to our worries about anthropomorphizing. Are we not anthropomorphizing when we attribute to God knowledge of what transpires in the world, cognizance? To avoid making God in our image, don't we have to understand ourselves as speaking figuratively when we attribute to God knowledge of any kind, knowledge of any spatial temporal particular whatsoever, including them, but not only, elocutionary acts. Answering that deeper question, not just that we're anthropomorphizing when we talk about God as listening and speaking, but more basically, when we talk about God as knowing, answering these questions requires then that we enter the much vexed topic of the status of predications concerning God. So that's the philosophical enterprise for the remainder of this lecture. <laughs> Though the terminology used in discussing these issues is pretty standard, different writers attach different meanings to the terms, resulting in a great deal of confusion and of talking past each other. So we're going to have to begin with some comments about terminology. In a number of papers that he published in the 1980s, William Alston, a dear friend of mine, after noting that the impossibility of literal talk about God has become almost an article of faith for theology in the 20th century, 
also after saying that, argue to the contrary that it is possible to affirm something true of God by speaking literally. And in the course of his argument, Alston made some extraordinarily helpful clarifying remarks about the terminology standardly used when discussing these issues. A good deal of what I'm going to say and what follows is, consists of things I learned from Alston. So first, let's distinguish among various ways of using a term. We can use a term literally, we can use a term figuratively, one example of figurative use, but just one being metaphorical. So we can use a term literally, we can use a term figuratively, and we can use a term with what I'm going to call analogical extension. The concept of literal and figurative use of terms is familiar, not so the concept of analogical extension. So let me explain it. Suppose that referring to my dog, I don't actually have a dog, I don't much like dogs, but anyway. <laughs> Sup suppose that referring to my dog, I assertively utter the sentence, he's a gem. I would then be using the term gem figuratively, more specifically, metaphorically. And I would be saying something true about my dog, let's assume. Were I speaking, li were I speaking literally, I would be saying something patently false. It has often been observed about good metaphors that a good metaphor leaves it somewhat open-ended as to what is being said about the thing in question, whereas a so-called dead metaphor has almost no open-endedness about it. When I predicate is a gem of my dog, that's very nearly a dead metaphor. One additional point here. I hold that when one uses a term figuratively, one uses it with its ordinary meaning. The difference between literal and figurative use lies not in using the term with two different meanings, but in saying two quite different things, performing two quite different illocutionary acts, while nonetheless using the term in the same, with the same meaning. Now suppose that I assertively utter, again referring to this dog of mine, he knows his master. Suppose further that when pressed on the matter, I say that since we know next to nothing about the interior life of dogs, or even whether they have an interior life, I don't actually know whether it's literally true of my dog that he knows his master, or whether it's what's literally true of him rather is that he does something rather like know his master. So what I am doing when I predicate the term knows of my dog is that I'm saying that he either literally knows or is doing something a good deal like that. And that's an example of what I mean by using a term with analogical extension. Knows or something very much like that. The reason I'm using the predicate is a gem figuratively when I apply it to the dog and not with analogical extension, is that I am most definitely not saying that my dog is a gem or a good deal like a gem. And so too, another example, the reason that the term blue is used, being used metaphorically and not with analogical extension, when we speak of a blue note, is that we are most definitely not saying that this sound is either blue or a lot like blue. Naturally, there will be some borderline cases. In the weekend art section of the New York Times for October 26, 2012, the music, NY Times music reporter Zachary Wolf reports on a conversation he had with the pianist Andres Schiff about J.F. Spock's well-tempered clavier. Schiff is reported as describing the key of C major as snow white, the key of B minor as deathly pitch black, D sharp minor as pale blue, C sharp and C sharp minor is both yellow, with the latter somewhat more intense than the former. These are metaphorical uses of color terms, not analogical extensions. Schiff is not saying that C sharp is yellow or very much like yellow. So now let's move on to a new point of terminology. 
It's with respect to a single use of a term that one can do what I've been doing so far. One can ask whether it's being used literally, figuratively, or by analogical extension. By contrast, the terms univocal, e equivocal, and analogical are used for making comparisons between two or more uses of a term. Okay, literal, figurative, analogical extension, single term. But then we can run comparisons. These two terms are, in these two cases, being used univocally, equivocally, or a special case of equivocal, analogically. If in predicating a term of A and a term of B, we say the same thing of A and of B, our two predications are univocal with respect to each other. If we say something different, our two predications are equivocal with respect to each other. You've always got to say with respect to. An analogical predication is a special case of equivocal. Suppose that in a case of equivocal predication, saying two different things, I predicate the same term of A and of B, but use the term literally in one case and with analogical extension in the other case, then the two terms are being used analogically with respect to each other. Two predications of the same term can obviously be univocal with respect to each other, that's utterly obvious. But the same term can also be used to make predications that are equivocal with respect to each other. For example, if the term has two established meanings, and I use it literally in one of those meanings and literally in the other of those two meanings, then I'm using it, it's the same term, but I'm using it equivocally. Or if I use the same term literally in one case, and either figuratively or by analogical extension in the other case, I am once again using the same term, but speaking equivocally, and so forth. You can run through the various combinations yourself. Um, when you run through the, the various combinations here, the result can seem to be dizzying. But let me just conclude this by saying I've introduced these distinctions, neither for their own sake, nor to induce a sense of vertigo in you, but rather to bring some necessary clarity into our discussion about predications concerning God. That's the topic. The main points to keep in mind are the following. It is with re respect to a single use of some term that one can ask whether it's being used literally, figuratively, or with analogical extension. It is with respect to two or more predications that one can ask whether these predications are univocal with respect to each other, equivocal with respect to each other, and if equivocal, whether analogical with respect to each other. Um, this point. It's easy to confuse the idea of using a term with analogical extension with the idea of analogical predications. That is, with the idea of two predications being analogical with respect to each other. So let me highlight the difference. Using a term, single term, with analogical extension, or two predications being analogical with respect to each other. The concept of analogical extension pertains to the single use of some term. It is only with respect to two or more predications that one can ask whether the predications are being used analogically with respect to each other. So whether it's possible to say something true about God by speaking literally, or only by speaking figuratively or by analogical extension, is one question. It's a different question whether a predication that is true of God and a predication that is true of human beings, whether those two can ever be equivocal with respect to each other, or whether two such predications must always be equivocal with respect to each other. Okay? We managed that peak so far? Easily the most influential discussion of predications concerning God is that by Thomas Aquinas. 
so much so that one cannot address our topic with anything near adequacy without considering what Aquinas had to say on the matter. So let me turn to that. And I'm going now to give you a non-standard um, idiosyncratic but indisputably correct <laughs> <laughs> interpretation of Aquinas. <clears throat> we all know that Aquinas had a doctrine of analogy. It was his view that if I predicate something true of God and also predicate something true of some creature, my two predications are never, never univocal with respect to each other. They are, they are always equivocal with respect to each other. And their equivocity may or not be of such a sort as to be analogical. Almost all commentators draw from this the conclusion that it was Aquinas' view that if the same term is predicated to both God and creatures, if both predications are true, and if the term is used literally in one case, then it cannot have been used literally in the other case. Most commentators draw the conclusion that if the term applies literally to creatures, then it does not also apply literally to God. They view that as following from Aquinas' doctrine of analogy. I regard it as decisively clear that that was not Aquinas' view. As we shall see, he clearly held that some of our terms are literally true both of God and of creatures. Though predications concerning God and predications concerning creatures are at best analogical with respect to each other, never univocal, nonetheless, some of our predicates apply literally both to God and to creatures. Clearly there's a puzzle in there. We'll get to that. So let's see how he was thinking. The question Aquinas poses in part one, question, three, article, question 13, article three of his Summa Theologiae, is whether, here's the question, whether any term can be said literally, the Latin is propria of God. Employing the distinction between saying a term literally of something and saying it metaphorically of the thing, Aquinas answers, not all terms are said metaphorically of God, but some are said literally. I'm quoting him. These are those terms, he says, that signify the perfections that flow from God and are to be found in creatures, yet which exist in God in an eminent way. And Aquinas gives us examples of the terms being, good, and living. These terms, he says, can be said literally of God. And he assumes that those three terms, at least, being, good, and living, can also be said literally of creatures. Now, there's no reason in the text to suppose that Aquinas is not using propria strictly and in the literal sense. And given that it is metaphorice that he contrasts with propria, our term literal is surely the right translation. In short, I think there can be no doubt that it was Aquinas' view that when using terms literally, we can affirm of God what is true of God by predicating of God such perfection terms as exists, good, and living, and that those same terms also apply literally to human beings. In the same respondeal, oh, I've got, um, <laughs> the one I read is the second passage no, we'll get to that. In the same respondeal, 113.3, Aquinas amplifies and clarifies his thought by means of the distinction between what is signified by a term. In Latin, it's res significata. So what is signified by a term? And the term's mode of significance, modus significandi. So res significandi, things signified, uh, significata and mo modus significandi, mode of signification. It is only so far as that which is signified is concerned that some terms are applied literally to God, he says. In fact, some terms are applied more properly to God than to creatures and are said primarily of God. 
That's with respect to the thing signified by literally both to God and creatures. With respect to mode of signification, however, there are no terms that can be literally said of God, for they all have a mode of signification that is relevant to creatures. What's he getting at? Aquinas assumes that his readers are familiar with this distinction between res significata, things signified, and the modus significandi of a term, the mode of signification. Um, but you and I are not familiar with this distinction. What's meant by the thing signified is pretty clear. Um, the thing signified is just the property that the predicate stands for, property signified or designated by the term. And when it's perfection terms that we're using, the thing signified, res significata, is the perfection that the term designates. Goodness, life, existence are his favorite examples. Things signified. So, but what about modus significandi? What Aquinas had in mind by the modus significandi is less clear, though I think it's still clear enough for our purposes. We get the essential information in his remark that our intellect apprehends these perfections, goodness, existence, and so forth. Our, goodness, our intellect apprehends these perfections in the mode that they're present in creatures. I think we will not go astray if we think of the mode of signi signification of a predicate term as what we would now call the connotation of the term. So think of the modus significandi as the connotation of the term. The thing signified is what the term stands for. Take any case of apprehending some property, any case of having the property in mind. Aquinas distinguishes between, on the one hand, the property apprehended, and on the other hand, one's way of apprehending the property. And his idea is that our way of apprehending a property is always shaped by familiarity with the way in which that property is exhibited in the things that we're familiar with. And so when I'm thinking of power, I'm thinking of power, we can distinguish between what I'm apprehending, namely power, and my way of thinking of it or apprehending it, the latter being shaped by the powerful things that I'm acquainted with. Of course, not only do I apprehend the property power, you do so as well, along with most other human beings. And so we can speak not just of my way of apprehending power, but of our way of apprehending power, our human way. And that will be shaped by the powerful things that we come in contact with. And Aquinas' thought then is that the distinction between the property we apprehend and our way of apprehending it is, as it were, carried over into the corresponding predicate term. Aspects of our way of apprehending some perfection and our creaturely experience become ingredients in the mode of signification of the term. Ingredients in, what, ingredients in what we would call its connotation. So a predicate term will not only signify a certain property, it will also express, I think express is maybe the best term here, express our particular human way of apprehending examples of that property. And whatever else may be true of our experiences, they will all have been experiences of creatures. So our way of thinking of properties is always inhabited by the notion, the reminiscences of the creatures that we've come across that exhibit it. Now Aquinas employs that distinction between the res significata of a term and its modus significandi to explain why it is that some terms can be predicated literally of God and some only metaphorically. Here's what he says. Those terms that are said literally of God do not include bodily conditions in that which is signified, but only in their mode of signification. Whereas those are, that are said only metaphorically of God include bodily conditions in the thing signified. Speaking more elaborately, he says this. That's the second on your sheet. 
There are some names which, reg which signify these perfections flowing from God to creatures in such a way that the imperfect way in which the creatures receive the divine perfection is part of the very signification, the res significata, of the name itself, as stone signifies a material being. And names of this kind can be applied to God only in a metaphorical sense because materiality is built into the thing signified. Other names, however, signify these perfections absolutely without any such mode of participation being part of their signification. As the words, that earthly mode of participation is only part of the mode of signification. And examples of this are the terms being, good, living, and the like. And such names can be literally said of God. Okay, so um, I think it's, <laughs> as I say, indisputable that Aquinas held that terms that are literally true of us, some terms, are also literally true of God. Right? Now on analogy. That was all on single terms, literal, literal, metaphorical, and so forth. Some can be applied literally to God and also to us. Now on uh, analogies. Two articles later, in the same question on the names of God, Aquinas poses a new question. He does not think that what he said about literality answers this new question. The new question is this. Whether terms are said equivocally, univocally, or equivocally of God and creatures, now we're running comparisons, right? Two predications, two or more predications, and asking how they relate to each other. Aquinas does not assume that this question has already been answered in what he said about the literality of speech about God. And our above discussion about, of terminology shows that he's right about that. But the point is so often, in my reading of the literature, so often, not only, but invariably overlooked, but I probably overlooked some uh, people who've written on the topic. The point is so often overlooked is to be worth repeating one more time. It's getting to be ad nauseum now. When considering whether a term has been used literally or figuratively, one takes a single instance of its use and poses one's question concerning that particular use. It makes no sense to ask concerning a single use whether it's used univocally or equivocally. It is only by reference to two or more predications of some term that one can raise the question whether the predications are univocal or equivocal. And you always have to add, with respect to each other. And if equivocal, whether they are analogical with respect to each other. Predications are never just analogical, period. They're only ever analogical with respect to each other. To the question whether terms are said univocally or equivocally of God and of creatures, Aquinas' answer is this. It is impossible to predicate anything univocally of God and creatures. That which is predicated of several things according to the same term, but not according to the same ratio, same meaning, is predicated of them equivocally. But no term applies to God with that meaning according to which it is said of a creature. The two predications will always be equivocal with respect to each other. Using the term is wise as his example, Aquinas then says, for wisdom in creatures is a quality, but not in God. And now we have a puzzle, right? Aquinas has insisted that perfection terms are literally true, both of God and of us. His reason being that the res significata of those perfection terms is just those perfections themselves, not any particular way of instantiating the perfections. Our creaturely ways of instantiating the perfections don't enter into the res significata of the terms. They enter only in its connotations or mode of significance. Yet, that said, as between God and creatures, neither perfection terms 
or any others, are ever predicated univocally. If they can be predicated literally both of us and of God, wisdom, goodness, existence, how can it possibly be the case that they're never predicated univocally? How can the same term in the same sense apply literally both to God and to us and yet our predications not be univocal with respect to each other? Begin with Aquinas' reason for holding that affirmative predications as between God and human beings are never univocal with respect to each other. Aquinas leaves no doubt as to why he holds this position. It's because God is ontologically simple, a thesis he has argued for earlier, whereas no creature is ontologically simple. Here's the idea. In God, there is no distinction between God and God's essence, between God and God's attributes, between one of God's attributes and another of God's attributes, and so forth. And it's this that Aquinas was alluding to when he said that the reason is wise cannot be predicated univocally of God and of creatures is that wisdom in creatures is a quality, but not in God. What he means by a quality is an attribute distinct from the substance of which it is the attribute. So in us, wisdom is a quality distinct from us. In God, wisdom is not a quality distinct from God himself. Suppose now, thought experiment, suppose now that you and I hold Aquinas' ontology. Creatures are ontologically complex, whereas God is ontologically simple. Nonetheless, we participate along with God in certain perfections. What would we then say on the topic of the univocity or equivocity of predications concerning God or creature and creatures? I submit that we would say the following. Given our conviction that God and we participate in the same perfections, we would say that in assertively uttering God is alive, God is good, God is powerful, and the like, the adjectives alive, good, powerful, designate or signify the same perfections that they do when referring to some human being. We say that human being is alive, good, or powerful. In assertively uttering about God, God is alive. In assertively uttering about Joe, Joe is alive. We are predicating the same form, as Aquinas sometimes calls it of these two very different beings. And in both cases, we're using the adjective alive, literally. But we would not, if we've got Aquinas' ontology in mind, we would not drop the matter there. Given our other conviction that God participates in perfections as a simple being, whereas we participate in perfections as complex beings, we would say that in predicating alive of God and of Joe, we're claiming a different relationship to hold in the two cases between the entity and its perfection. Though the adjective alive has the same sense in both cases, the copula is means something different in the two cases. So in predicating is alive of both God and Joe, our predications are univocal with respect to the adjective, but equivocal with respect to the copula. Okay? That's what we would say if we held Aquinas' ontology. I said that this is what we would say if we embraced Aquinas' ontology. And this is what Aquinas does say. Let me quote again the passage quoted just above in which Aquinas declares that all predications as between God and creatures are equivocal. Here's how it goes. That which is predicated of several things according to the same term, but not according to the same meaning, is predicated of them equivocally. But no term applies to God with that same ratio according to which it is said of a creature. 
So even if the term is the same, it is not predicated according to the same meaning. That is, with the same import. The predicating does not have the same import. The term does not apply to God according to the same ratio. To say it again, our predication of the same predicate term, perfection term to God and to creatures is equivocal with, with respect to the adjective. You never go with respect to the adjective, but equivocal with respect to the copula. One more point here. It is not the, uh, uh, the copula, however, is not merely equivocal. The import, uh, his Latin word is ratio, the import, the import of the copula, the ratio of the copula. The ratio of the copula in the two cases is not completely different and unconnected. The copula is not being used purely equivocally. Its import when predicating something of God is an analogical extension of its import when predicating something of God. In both cases, one is claiming some, as he puts it, some mode of participation in the perfection by the entity referred to. God's relation to the perfection designated by the adjective is something like our relation. So when we predicate is alive of God, let me say it again, we are using the term alive literally, whereas we're using the copula is with analogical extension. In short, Aquinas' doctrine of analogy pertains to the act of predicating, not to what is predicated. Somewhat more precisely, it pertains to the copula, not to the adjective. To say it one more time, when we predicate is wise, both of God and of some human being, our predications are univocal with respect to the adjective, but analogical with respect to the copula. And by now it should go without saying that to say of two of our predications that they are analogical with respect to the copula is fully compatible with saying of the adjective that is being used literally in both cases. Now I can imagine somebody replying that the interpretation of Aquinas, the non-conventional idiosyncratic interpretation, but indubitably true, <laughs> that I have just now offered is a radical overinterpretation of the extremely brief comments about the ratio of predications in the said contra of uh, Summa Theologia 113.5. My response is that maybe it would be overinterpretation if that passage were the full extent of what Aquinas had to say on the matter, but it's not. So now let's turn to the next passage. Um, that long one on the sheet. Univocal predication, now we're talking about comparisons now. Univocal predication is impossible. He's already said that we apply cert that certain terms, two articles earlier, he said that certain terms apply literally to God, okay? Now we're on um, univocal equivocal predications. Univocal predication is impossible between God and creatures. The reason for this is that every effect which is not an adequate result of the power of the efficient cause, receives the similitude of the agent, not in a full degree, but in a measure that falls short of the cause. So that what is divided and multiplied in the effects resides in the agent simply and in the same manner. As for example, the sun by the exercise of its own power produces manifold and various forms and all inferior things. Okay. In the same way, all perfections existing in creatures divided and multiplied pre-exist in God unitedly. That's the doctrine of divine simplicity. And so when some term pertaining to a perfection is said of a creature, it signifies that perfection, it signifies that perfection in distinction from others. For example, when the term wise is said of a human being, we signify a perfection distinct from the essence of the person, from his powers, his existence, and from all the other things about him. But when we say this term of God, we don't intend to signify something distinct from his essence or power or existence. 
Hence it is clear that the term wise is not said of God and of a human being according to the same ratio. It's the same term, but it's not said according to the same meaning. The same point holds for other terms. Accordingly, no term is predicated univocally of God and creatures, but also not purely equivocally, as some have said. Therefore, it must be said, because we both, creatures and God, both participate in perfections, even though their nature of their particip participation is different. Therefore, it must be said that terms that are said of God and of creatures according Terms are said of God and of creatures according to analogy, that is, proportion. I take it that that's a very clear statement of the position that I've been arguing for. I've got some other passages there, but I think you can, you can read those for yourself. Um, I've also got a section here that I'm going to skip that I call English Translations Conceal Aquinas' Thought. Um, if you look at the Blackfriars translation, if you look either at the Blackfriars, Blackfriars translation or the um, Dominican translation, um, you are going to see that the authors never really caught the idea, never, it, that it never really sank in what Aquinas said earlier, that certain terms apply literally both to God and to us. And so the Latin gets seriously mistranslated to have it turn out that no term applies literally to God and to us. Um, when it seems starkly clear that that's what the Latin says. Um, if you're curious, I can refer you to those passages. Let me bring it to a, start bringing it to a conclusion. Speaking for ourselves, finally. You may have noticed that whereas I distinguish between using a term literally, using a term figuratively, and using a term with analogical extension, Aquinas distinguished only between the literal and metaphorical uses of terms. I hold that we need the idea of using a term with metaphorical extension to identify, for example, how the term knows is being used of my dog when I say that I, it knows its master. Clearly, that's not a figurative use of the term. It's not like saying that my dog is a gem, nor is it like describing the sea of D sharp minor as pale blue. But given that we know next to nothing about the inner life of a dog, I don't know, speaking literally, whether my dog knows its master. Whereas I do know, speaking literally, that it's got four legs. So my suggestion was that when I predicate knows his master of my dog, I'm saying this, either he knows his master or something very much like that. That's what I call applying the term with analogical extension. So I think we need the notion of literal, figurative, and analogical extension to make sense of the terrain here. As we saw what motivated Aquinas to distinguish between predications that are analogous with respect to their predicate terms and predications that are analogous with respect to the copula was this doctrine of divine simplicity. Now the doctrine of divine simplicity has had a profound influence on theology. In Aquinas' case, it was the first conclusion he drew from his argument that reality is such that there must be, some, that there must be something that is the unconditioned condition of all that is not identical with itself. A simple being is one in which there is no distinction of any sort whatsoever. Here's Aquinas' thought. If God's essence were distinct from God himself, then God would be conditioned by something distinct from God himself, namely God's essence. Now, given the degree to which the doctrine of divine simplicity has shaped Christian theology, a theologian or philosopher like myself, who is a member of the Christian tradition, does not discard the doctrine lightly. Nonetheless, I think it should be discarded. Some have argued that the doctrine is inherently incoherent. Though it is indeed true that it cannot be given coherent articulation within certain ontological frameworks, I have argued elsewhere that it can be given articulate 
co coherent articulation within an Aristotelian framework, which of course was the one that Aquinas was using. So I don't hold that the doctrine is necessarily incoherent. Among my reasons for thinking nonetheless that we should discard the doctrine are the following two. I don't find the argument compelling that reality is such that there has to be something that is the unconditioned condition of all that is not distinct from itself. But more important, the doctrine of simplicity seems to me ultimately incompatible with the doctrine of God as triune. It forces us into modalism. To say that God is triune is perforce to say that there's some sort of distinction within God, a distinction of persons, to use the traditional concept. So what my rejection of divine simplicity implies is that in my way of thinking about these matters, I have no need for Aquinas' idea of predications concerning God and creatures that are equivocal with respect to the copula but univocal with respect to the predicate. On my view, the copula is always used with the same single force. God is vastly beyond our comprehension. We have no idea, none at all, as to how God creates. We have no idea, none at all, as to how God sustains the universe. Quite clearly though, creation does require something rather like knowledge. Hence it is that over and over the psalmist celebrated the wisdom of God. So my suggestion is that when we apply the term knows to God, we are not speaking figuratively, but we are using the term with analogical extension. When we say of God that God is the rock of our salvation, we're using the term rock metaphorically as a figure of speech. I think that saying that God knows is not like that. Knows is not being employed metaphorically as a figure of speech. We are saying, I think, that God either knows or does something a good deal like knowing. And it follows that our predications of knows, of creatures and of God, are analogical with respect to each other. As a warrant for interpreting the term knows when applied to God, as used neither literally nor figuratively, but with analogical extension, I said that the creation and preservation of the universe requires if not knowledge, something very much like knowledge. There's another consideration as well. The writer of Genesis declares that we have been created in the image of God, in the likeness of God. Nothing of the sort is said about the other animals. As we all know, the writer gave no explanation of what's meant by saying that we're created in the image and likeness of God. The context provides a few hints, however, but only a few with, as you know, the result that there are mountains of speculation on what constitutes the image of God. But given that no other animals are said to have been made in the image and likeness of God, one infers that it has something to do with our being persons, personic animals, animalic persons. And our capacity for knowledge is a central component in our personhood. I think it's hard to resist the conclusion that among other things, we image God in our capacity for knowledge. In the order of attribution, we learn how to apply the nose to human persons and then apply it by analogical extension to God. In the order of things, what we call knowledge in us is an image of something that is a good deal like that in God. Aquinas generalizes the point by saying that perfections flow from God to us. So let's return to where we began. Unless one is speaking figuratively, is it not a painfully childish anthropomorphism to say of God that God listens and speaks? Isn't a Maimonides style critique and analysis of the liturgy required at this basic point? What we saw earlier is that when one attends to and grasps what was said to one, Neither the speech act that one attends to and grasps, nor the actions of attending to and grasping it, are as such bodily actions. In your and my case, we perform these actions by way of performing certain bodily actions. But those actions themselves are not bodily. I see no reason to doubt that God can attend to and grasp what we say to God, even though God has no body. 
God cannot taste strawberries. One needs a tongue for that. Not so for attending to and grasping the illocutionary acts that we perform. And as to applying the terms attend to and grasp of God, these are not figurative uses of the terms, I would say, but these two are analogical extensions. To say of God that God attends to and grasps what we say to him is to say of God that God either attends to and grasps what we say to him or does something a good deal like that. We are not engaged in childish anthropomorphisms. Everything I've said about how we should understand the claim, the claim that God listens to us applies with appropriate adaptations to how we should understand the claim that God speaks to us. When we say of God that God speaks, I think we are using the term speaks with analogical extension. Aquinas, along with many others, recognizes only two ways of using terms, the literal and the figurative. I hold that between those two ways lies using a term with analogical extension. When saying that God speaks and listens, consequently, we're not impaled on the dilemma of either speaking literally and hence thinking anthropomorphically or speaking figuratively. We're using the terms listens and speaks with analogical extension. Thanks.